In this video, I'm going to cover catalysts. Catalysts are substances that affect the rate of a reaction without being consumed. Catalysts work by providing an alternative mechanism for the reaction with a lower activation energy. Catalysts are consumed in an early mechanism step and then made in a later step. So here's a mechanism without a catalyst. O3 plus O makes 2O2. It's very, very slow. For an ozone particle to react with an oxygen atom in the upper atmosphere to create two oxygen molecules is very, very slow. Um, this is the uh, reaction coordinate diagram that shows that. Remember, the rate of a reaction is a function of its activation energy. So if it's very slow, that means it has a very, very high activation energy. So if it has a very high activation energy, this is very unlikely to happen. It has to, these two have to bump into each other with a lot of energy in order for this to happen. But if I put in a catalyst, um, then a catalyst can decrease the activation energy. And if the activation energy is decreased, then the reaction can happen faster. So O3 is ozone, and ozone protects us from ultraviolet rays from the sun. So O3 reacting with free oxygen atoms is bad because then our ozone layer becomes depleted. So it's good that this reaction is very, very slow because we want to protect our ozone. We don't want it reacting. We want to keep it up in the upper atmosphere to protect us from ultraviolet rays. However, when halogen atoms get into the upper atmosphere, like chlorine or iodine or fluorine or bromine, these halogen atoms that get into the upper atmosphere, they can react with O3 even better than oxygen can. So Cl reacts with O3 and it makes this species very, very fast. And so this is the first step. And then the next step, the ClO reacts with another O and I make O2 and the Cl comes back. So this is bad for two reasons. It's bad because one, it reacts with ozone faster and so I'm gonna deplete ozone faster and the UV rays will get to us. And this is bad too because Cl breaks the ozone apart, but then the last step makes another Cl. So what's that Cl gonna do? The one that was just made is gonna go and break another one apart. And then another one will get made, or that same one. So we don't need to have we don't need to have a billion chloride particles to break the ozone apart. All I need is one. One chloride particle can go through this process and uh, join to oxygen and then join to another oxygen and break the O3 apart. And then that chlorine particle goes back, finds another O3, breaks it apart. And then that chlorine particle goes back and finds another O3 and breaks it apart. So a catalyst is something that makes a reaction happen faster and it's also something that is not destroyed during the reaction. It's there at the beginning of the reaction, and it's also there at the end of the reaction. So um, we've just found another piece of our mechanistic puzzle here. So does this mechanism, there's two steps here, right? Two elementary steps. Does this mechanism have any intermediates? Yes. Remember that an intermediate is something that is formed after the first reaction or after a subsequent reaction. It's formed as a product and then it's used up as a reactant. And so it does not appear in the overall reaction because it gets canceled out. Product, reactant. This is an intermediate. But now we have something else that's happening here. We have an intermediate that appears in the middle. It's not there at the beginning and it's not there at the end, it's in the middle. And then I have another species here, a catalyst, that appears at the beginning and at the end. So here is my CL at the beginning and here's my CL at the end. So this is a catalyst. It, the same thing happens though. Um, reactant product gets canceled out. Reactant 
product gets canceled out. So when I write this overall reaction, the reaction is 1O3 plus 1O makes 2O2. Just like the overall reaction up here. So adding Cl doesn't change the reaction. It's the same overall reaction. But it changes the way by which it gets there. It changes the path. It changes the mechanism. Adding Cl as a catalyst creates an intermediate. And then that intermediate can react with oxygen again and replenish the catalyst. And the catalyst goes back to the beginning of the cycle. So another way that we can affect the rate of a reaction, we've talked about temperature and um, nature of the reactant and pressure and uh, concentration, many different ways to affect the rate. Another one is with catalysts. Catalysts generally speed a reaction up. So they give the reactant molecules a different path to follow with a different lower activation energy. So they don't change the overall reaction, they just make it happen in a different way. Heterogeneous catalysts hold one reactant molecule in a proper orientation for the reaction to occur when the collision takes place. Sometimes they also help by start breaking, by, uh, breaking bonds. Homogeneous catalysts react with one of the reactant molecules to form a more stable activated complex with a lower activation energy. So here's another example. Actually, it's the same example. So um, the uncatalyzed reaction has a transition state that's very high energy and it has a very high activation energy. But the catalyzed pathway lowers the activation energy and now it happens in two steps. We create an intermediate, unstable intermediate, that then reproduces the catalyst and that catalyst particle can break apart more and more ozone. That's why um, we had to stop releasing CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, into the atmosphere because we were destroying the ozone layer. So a homogenous catalyst is in the same phase as the reactant particle. So chlorine gas in the destruction of ozone gas, that would be homogenous because they're in the same phase. So it's like a solution. They would be dissolved in each other. They're in a solution. A heterogeneous catalyst is one that's in a different phase. So if I have um, uh, a reaction that's occurring in solution, Pro, um, products that are dissolved in a solvent, and then we throw in some solid metal particles, metal powder. That metal powder is solid. It's not going to dissolve in the water or in the solvent, but the metal powder can act as a surface for uh, dissolved particles to grab onto, which can sometimes in certain reactions help to speed them up. So a catalyst might be in the same phase as the reactants, and, and it would be dissolved in a solution that's homogeneous, or it could be in a different phase. It could be powder metal in a liquid, um, surfing as a surface for reactant particles to grab onto. Another example is the catalytic converter in a car's exhaust system. So catalytic converter is a solid piece of metal, and the gases that pass through the, dirt, um, dirt, through the solid metal are converted from dirty gases into cleaner gases. They're still not very clean, but they're cleaner than they were. So that's a heterogeneous catalyst because the catalyst is solid and the reactants are gases. They're in different phases. Again, homogeneous catalysts will be dissolved. they will be a solution. And heterogeneous catalysts will be generally a surface, like a solid in a gas or in a liquid. And then the gas or liquid particles can grab onto the surface, which will either weaken the bonds in the reactant or sometimes put them in the proper orientation so that a reactant particle that bumps into it will have this, a perfect shot to make that bond. They'll be perfectly aligned when they're um, adsorbed to a catalyst surface. So here's an example of that. Um, uh, hydrogen H2 gas adsorbs really well to some metals. And adsorbing means it gets stuck to the surface. When something is absorbed with a B, it gets sucked inside. When something is adsorbed with a D, that means it gets stuck to the surface. So hydrogen will get adsorbed onto the surface of metal. Um, nitrogen in particular, it gets stuck pretty well. 
So then those hydrogen atoms are just kind of floating on the outside of the nitrogen, or excuse me, the nickel. When a molecule of ethylene gas comes by, then two of those hydrogen atoms can add to it. It kind of, these hydrogen atoms on the ethylene also get stuck to the metal. So these hydrogens kind of get stuck to it like a, ma a magnet. And then these hydrogens on the ethylene get stuck to it like a magnet. And so now all of the reactants are kind of floating around together on the surface and there's a much easier chance for them to uh, come into contact with each other because they're all floating around on the surface of the same metal. So now these two hydrogen atoms can get close enough to the carbon to form another bond. So you see we went from here we had two hydrogen atoms on each carbon and over here I have three hydrogen atoms on each carbon. So the surface is a catalyst. It doesn't actually do, it's not part of the reaction. Nickel doesn't appear up here in the chemical reaction, chemical equation. But nickel helps the reaction occur because it sucks in the hydrogen, it sucks in the ethylene, and then they're all right next to each other and the reaction can occur very easily. And then pop, and then the, the product particle comes off. Another kind of catalyst is called an enzyme. And an enzyme is another one of those heterogeneous catalysts. It's kind of like um, a metal surface uh, because it's a big solid particle, but an enzyme is much more specific than a metal surface. A metal surface is just uh, lots of repeating atoms in no general shape, just making a surface that uh, can be sticky to certain kinds of substances. An enzyme is a particle that has a very, very specific shape a shape that's kind of like a lock and the reactant molecule that fits inside of that enzyme is like a key. So you can't just put your key in any old lock. Keys and locks are incredibly specific. Your key has to go in the right lock. They're, they're designed to fit each other. So enzymes are similar. A metal surface is not, an, a metal surface will react with anything. An enzyme will only react with the reactant particles that it was made to react with. So here's an example. An enzyme is like a lock, and here are the A and B particles. A plus B makes C. Well, A and B have to run into each other and when they're bouncing around like pinballs in order to make C. And A plus B having that very specific geometry is sometimes uh, uh, very rare. It, it happens very infrequently because the requirements, the geometric requirements, might be very high. Well, if A has to run into B in a very specific way, what if there was a, another molecule like a lock that locks A into place and then it locks B into place and then they're perfectly in the right orientation and the right shape in order to form a bond. That's what an enzyme does. An enzyme is kind of like a molecule that has arms. So it doesn't really have arms, but you can imagine that it's like a molecule that has arms and it can kind of grab on to this one and it can kind of reach out and grab on to this one and then it can kind of stick them together, right? Sticks them together. So an enzyme is a molecule that has a very specific shape that brings in the reactant particles and then the reactant particles can form a bond and then the enzyme kind of changes and it spits out the particle. So um, there are two different molecule, there are two different mechanisms for um, enzyme catalysts. So the enzyme is a really, really big molecule. It's called a protein, and it's made of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and hydrogen. And um, the molecules A and B, the reactants, those are called substrates. So the substrates fit into the active site of the enzyme. The active site is like the lock, and the lock fits the key from the reactant particles. So when the enzyme and the substrate react together, this is called the substrate complex. The enzyme and the substrate are stuck together. So then a bond is formed and the product leaves. Hello? Hey, honey bunny. Hi, honey bunny. Hi, so this first model is the lock and key model where the 
um, shape of the active site is already the right shape. You see that the different particles this in this cartoon, this one has kind of a round shape. It fits in this part of the active site. This one has kind of a pointy shape and it fits in this part of the active site. So in the lock and key model, the enzyme already has an active site that is the right shape to fit the two particles. In the induced fit model, um, when one of the substrate particles bonds to the enzyme, it changes the shape of the active site. Bonding one of the substrates change the, changes the shape, and that causes uh, the, the active site to uh, have the same shape as the second substrate. So if the active site has to change in order to fit one or the other or both substrates, then we call that the induced fit model. So here is um, an example of what this might look like. So here is a molecule of sucrose. And a molecule of sucrose is made of two parts. It's made of this glucose ring over here where you can kind of see this ring with some stuff hanging off of it. And it's made of this fructose ring. And here's the fructose ring over here with some stuff hanging off of it. So they're stuck together right here um, by this glycosidic bond in between the two carbohydrate molecules, the two monosaccharides. So in this, um, mo in this reaction, this one molecule of sucrose, the bond is going to break, and then I'm going to have a molecule of fructose and a molecule of glucose. Right After this bond breaks in half, uh, becomes hydrolyzed by water, water comes in and breaks the bond. So then when the bond is broken, I've split the, the sucrose molecule into one fructose and one glucose. So uh, the way that this, this process can happen without an enzyme, but it's really, really slow. If we put an enzyme in there, the specific enzyme is called sucrase. Sometimes molecules with an ASE ending are enzymes, and molecules with an OSE ending are sugars. So sucrase is the enzyme that breaks apart sucrose, the carbohydrate. So even though it's possible for this bond to break in the absence of an enzyme, when sucrase is, sucrase is around, the bond will break much faster. The rate of the reaction is increased because the activation energy is decreased. And the activation energy is decreased for two reasons. One, because uh, these particles will already be in the proper orientation. I guess in this case, since we're only talking about one particle, there's not really much of an orientation that we're looking at. But um, when the two particles are in the active site, then the enzyme can kind of change shape a little bit. And as it changes shapes, it can literally start to pull the particles apart from each other, and they can weaken this bond. So the active site um, can help to stick two particles together by orienting them correctly. And it can also help to speed up a reaction by weakening bonds which lowers the activation energy because remember that activation energy is really just a measure of the energy that's in the bond to be broken for the reaction to happen.